Let's go over the design criteria for our project. If you watch the YouTube introductory video, um, I couldn't find this. I don't know why it was right there in my uh, notability list. Uh, I couldn't find it, so I went over a different one. This is uh, what I did for submittal one. And everybody got 100% for this. Typically, I would make you do this, but we're getting a late start on a project, so um, I did it. When you take a senior design class, you do make these, and I just saw a few of these. They just had their, I think, 15% submittal last week, and, and, and uh, they were supposed to uh, turn these sorts of things in. So if you're in that class and you're doing the buildings, you should turn in something like this. Okay, here are the design criteria that I uh, put together for our project. I, I went on Google, I looked up Lincoln, Nebraska, and it turns out that in Lincoln, they're using the 2012 IBC, and they did have amendments to it, which I really didn't read. Uh, our building is a medical outpatient building. I talked about this in the YouTube video on uh, the introduction and we have a category two building which is a just a normal building it is an outpatient building but there, we don't have any patients that are immobile so that doesn't trigger the special hazardous building category three and because it's category two all our importance factors when you calculate loads are 1.0 okay here are floor live loads um, um, I came up with 100 PSF in the lobby. I decided that, I think I read somewhere in ACE 7, that corridor on the first floor is 100 PSF, which doesn't matter. That's not a floor we're designing, that's on the ground. So 80 PSF. Offices I got were 50 PSF and 50 PSF partition. Stairs and landing. These are just all things I, I read in uh, the ASCE 7 and IBC code. Stairs and landings, 100 PSF. Uh, HVAC rooms, 150 PSF. I did say light storage. Okay, so there's 100 PSF for light storage. And a flat roof has 20 PSF live load. Um, roof loads, uh, snow loads are 30 PSF. But let me explain the building again. So we have the building, and we do have uh, some HVAC units on the roof that have a certain weight. Um, they're on the drawing, and you don't want snow to get on that. So I said what we were going to do is build trusses on top of the building to protect that from the snow. And so there's the snow. Can you see that snow load is not going on the actual roof we're designing? Instead, that snow load is going to go on these beams on the edge here as reactions to the truss. Okay, but you still need to know that if you're designing the girders on the roof because you're going to get this snow load. Okay. Uh, and then there's the snow load and you took 3,200. You, you need to know all this kind of stuff to get the actual snow load. Uh, the wind load criteria are all here. We're not doing wind load in our project, but if you're taking 4,900, uh, you have to know these things and know how to calculate wind loads. Um, I know one of you, uh, I owe a uh, look over at your wind load calculations. I'll get to that after I finish all these project videos. Seismic load criteria, I totally skipped this. I didn't talk about it. Um, I think in your 4,900 class, you talk about it, but, um, yeah, I just thought I was going to talk about it, maybe some other time. The foundation criteria, um, I'm, I, so I'm predicting the future. I'm going to write you a geotech report, which I haven't done. Um, so this little geotech report, um, uh, I'm going to make up. And what it's going to say is that the bearing pressure of the soil is 3,300 PSF. And if it doesn't, I messed up the geotech report. I do want you to use these numbers. I uh, looked up the code uh, in Lincoln. Uh, it says that their frost depth is three feet. 
And so here's your ground, and this will um, uh, this will come into play when we do the foundation design. So here's your ground. So by the way, if you need to draw ground hatching, this is the easiest way to do it. Okay, so there's the ground, and 36 inches. It could have frost, and so your footing, the top of your footing has to be at least 30, no, the bottom of your footing. What am I saying? The bottom of your footing needs to be at 36 inches. There we go. Um, we don't need this, but in 4,900, you'll need that. Uh, we don't have a basement, but if we had a basement and we had something like this, um, uh, you would need to design this wall to withstand that lateral pressure. And I believe in 4,900, you have to do that. And if you need to do that, come see me. I can help you uh, design that. Okay, uh, I have picked F prime C as 4,000. I just picked it and I picked the steel at 60 KSI. Okay, oh, right here. Um, we're not doing the shear walls because we're not doing the lateral, but I, I think I said we're making reinforced masonry and shear walls. And again, um, 4,900, I saw some of you making some small square building out of CMU. I could help you with that if you need help with that. Uh, we are not doing any structural steel in here. Uh, this is leftover from a real project I had in a 4,900 class where there were some steel components to the building. Okay. Um, this talks about the trusses that go over the roof. We're not designing that, so you can ignore that. Um, this is in words, the picture I'm about to show you. You can read that. You have this document. This is in words, the picture I'm about to show you. I was super lazy. Uh, you can see how these are the same. I made the roof and the floor the same. Uh, you would not really ever do that, but... Uh, I just didn't have time to make two separate drawings for the roof and the floor. The lateral load resisting system, I just made this up. Uh, we're gonna use masonry, shear walls. Uh, again, we're not doing that, not part of our project. This is part of our project. You are gonna do foundations and we're gonna do spread footings. Okay, so this is the design criteria. This is an example of something uh, you would really do but in addition to this, you're supposed to have drawings. And oh, there it is. And so you have a drawing of, of the system. And so uh, we went over this drawing in a previous video, so I'm not going to go over that. But what I did do was I estimated the sizes of everything, okay, uh, by using my 1 in 12 rule. So you see how this beam here is 23 feet long? Oh, go away. What is that? Oh, can you do that again? See how that beam there is 23 feet long? So I estimated the depth was 23 inches. I rounded it. So I said, oh, the beam is 24 inches deep by 12 inches wide. Um, I estimated this 35 feet long. Oh, 36 inches deep, 18 inches wide. And then I totally guessed this. Um, just to be the same width as the girder. So I said 18 by 18. Okay, so you can see those guesses. Um, oh, and then uh, I'll talk about how to design the thickness of the slab. It's super easy, but I came up with five inches thick. So um, you can see that here. So I said uh, roughly a five inch slab, 12 inch by 24 inch beams, and 18 inch by 36 girders and 18 inch square columns. We'll see how good a guesser I am if, the, if everything comes out that big. But you saw it took me like three minutes to come up with those sizes. Uh, we'll see if I, how, good, how good of a guess those all were. And in case you're wondering where all the earthquake stuff comes from, here's the website you go to. Uh, you, what you have to do, you have to Google the address get the coordinates, type the coordinates into this website, and it gives you all the information you need to know 
to get the seismic design notes. And as I mentioned in the YouTube video, this, this is not the most exact thing in the world. Okay, uh, that is uh, the design criteria and uh, we'll continue the videos.